All right, so uh, welcome to our panel on educational issues. Uh, the, the goal is, the reason we decided to, to look into this as a, as a potential panel for, for a GUR this year is that, uh, you know, as we've been growing as an industry, it's uh, increased the demand for, for game user researchers at all levels of, of, of the practitioner spectrum. Um, but additionally, and sort of a longer term basis, as, as we continue to be, to grow and be successful as an industry, um, we're going to have to think about replacing us, uh, those of us who are, who are doing this job now. So it, it really behooves us collectively to start thinking about issues of how do we find people, how do we identify people who can be good at gaming user researchers, how do we train them, how do we get them into the jobs where they'll be most useful, and how do we sort of, you know, to use the sort of art term, how do we build that pipeline uh, to keep bringing uh, talented people along and, and, and move them into positions where they can be helpful. So um, we've assembled a, a really great group here today, I think, to talk about this. And uh, we're, the format we're going to tend to use here, we're going we're gonna to try to keep our piece a little short. You'll notice that rather than the traditional five-person panel, we have a four-person panel, and that's because we're hoping to have you guys as the audience operate as sort of a fifth member here. So uh, we're going to go through a couple of topic areas that we think are, are relevant and important and, and uh, talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to try to open up the floor here pretty early on to questions so that we can discuss. Because we really, really want to hear a lot of the stuff that you guys have to say about this uh, as well. So any questions before we get started? Sorry, it's a teacher habit. Uh, all right. <laughs> OK, excellent. So uh, I think probably the best way to start is to just introduce ourselves uh, very briefly. So um, I thought about trying to do introductions for everybody. I'm not sure I can do them justice. So I think we'll all do our own individual little pieces here. Uh, so I'm Dr. Adams Greenwood Erickson, uh, but please call me Adams. Um, I'm a human factor psychologist by training. And uh, I help run the Full Sail user, user Research Lab in Orlando, Florida, the campus of Full Sail University. Um, I, you can see a little, there's a little bit of movement going on. There's a bunch of my students up here at the front. Um, so pay no attention to them. Unless they so uh, my interest here is in, in finding uh, the, you know, the best ways that I can to train them to make sure that they are, they are ready to fulfill the roles that, that are needed in the industry and uh, so, that, so that they can go on and, and have great careers and contribute to the game user research community. So that's why I'm here. This is Dr. Noreen Curran. Uh, can Noreen. you guys hear me? I'm just going to test. OK, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Dr. Noreen Curran. Uh, I'm actually based in Ireland. Um, I did my uh, university studies there. So my background is applied psychology. Uh, my PhD was in the psychology of immersion in games. So uh, it's very kind of hardcore psychometrics, trying to develop tools to measure people's experience in games. Um, but currently, I'm working as the user research lead uh, at Logitech, uh, the gaming user research lead. And um, I guess. I've spent maybe the past six years teaching in, in different kind of formats. So I've taught like in university, I've taught like online courses, and currently I kind of work with students who come to us on placement to do user research, uh, kind of hands-on work and get some experience as part of their games, just generally games research courses. Mm -hmm. So that's me. Uh, hi, my name is Casey Miss Kelly. Um, I went through the full cell user experience um, uh, lab with Adams here and and Sean Stafford and. Uh, <laughs> Just graduated in February with my master's of game design from Full Sail. Um, I, you know, went through my job search process and thankfully already found a job. And I, I'm hoping to kind of bring a little bit of that perspective to the panel here um, about what it's like, you know, looking for a job in this industry and uh, different things that I noticed. Um, so some of the things that we do in the lab, you know, we, we write reports for the partners that we work with, whether it's competitive analysis. Um, or you know, expert analysis. Uh, we also do usability and play tests as well. So I'm hope, hoping to kind of just bring a little bit of a different perspective to what we have to talk about today. Dr. Matthew White, I administrate the game development program at Penn State University. Um, we're in the Erie campus, which is the uh, colder armpit of the state. Uh, but so uh, I have a contingent of probably about 150 students, most of whom are software engineers, a uh, small handful of whom are uh, human factors psychologists that uh, sort of double up uh, backgrounds, cognitive science, and statistics. Um, and hopefully I can bring a oft reviled quantitative edge to the conversation. Excellent. So uh, I think the, the logical place to start uh, is to talk a little bit about some of what we think are the key issues. Uh, facing game user research education establishment at this point. Um, for my part, I think that one of the biggest problems we have is that we don't have a real clear sense of what we mean when we say game user research, I think, to some degree. When, when someone, when I, oftentimes when our students are applying for positions, they'll see things that say UX designer or mm -hmm. user research designer or usability specialist or uh, usability artist. And it's not always clear, I think, to the companies and also to, um, 
to, or to employers and also potentially to people who are looking for those positions, it's not really clear what particular skill set is necessary for that. And I think that's partly an issue of terminology. I think it's also partly an issue that I think maybe we collectively as an industry don't really know what we want some of the time for some of this. So I feel like a really important issue for us to think about is starting to standardize some of the vocabulary and some of the skill sets uh, for these job descriptions. So, you know, what does a UX designer do versus what does a usability researcher do versus what does a game user researcher do? Are those all the same thing? Are they a little different? Uh, I don't have the answers to these, but I do think that we as an industry need to start thinking about that. So that would be what I think is one of sort of the key issues going forward. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that that's a really, really big problem, and that's something that we're going to have to tackle, but I think it's going to take a little while as well. Um, I guess I guess in Ireland specifically, so all of my experience really has been in Ireland, um, there, there's very little scope for doing a lot of work specifically in games user research, so a lot of the positions involved doing games user research and a lot of other work. So it's, it's very difficult for someone who's purely interested in research to come along and actually learn and do that. So a lot of the courses really, you, you, you can't really, it's very difficult to find out even if they have a games user research component when you start doing any of the games development courses, a lot of them are very kind of programming focused and, um, you know, a lot of them don't even have a component of that. So I think that's a pretty big issue at the moment. I like to speak to that sort of too. Um, as I was, you know, looking for jobs myself, uh, I noticed a lot of positions, they would, you know, they would advertise, the title would be UX researcher, but I would read through the, the job description and realize that this was really a design position. And, um, you know, through working in the lab, we didn't do a whole lot of design. It was mostly research, doing reports and things like that, analytics. And um, that was that was pretty frustrating because, um, you know, it, not, I don't want to say it was a waste of my time, but just that inconsistency with terminology was um, something that was very prevalent that I saw. And actually the position that I've received an offer for, um, I thought it was really cool. Um, the thing that stood out to me the most about it was at the bottom of the job description, it distinguished between, um, you know, it said this is a UX research position, not a design position. And I, it's really stood out to me that they knew the difference there. And um, I think it's going to be really important that we um, begin to kind of standardize and distinguish between those differences uh, so we can kind of determine the, the demand for those different skill sets in the, in the industry. You know, maybe I have the left field thing here, and I think I always do. Um, my students see a different kind of overlap. Uh, we, like I say, we're mostly software engineers, and engineers of different variety. And there's a there's a position nowadays that's kicking around that people are calling a testing engineer, or engineer in test, or data engineer. The words get tossed around. Even engineer gets tossed around. Um, so we lose, I think, some uh, clarity in that definition. A lot of my students uh, anticipate that they're going to do more traditional software testing, like user testing in the sense of uh, looking for errors, more uh, specifically system testing. And then they end up getting a very research focused uh, sort of interview, and they're very much at a loss. And on the other hand, those students who have the engineer title after their name have this idea, uh, particularly my more research-focused students, have this set of research skills and have this set of sort of statistic skills and interviewing skills. And when they interview for this data engineer, which does say, you know, like research users through the pipeline, uh, informed design decisions, they get a very, uh, they get a very engineering heavy uh, interview. So it, it seems like there is a real disconnect between what the students are being taught or what I'm trying to teach them, you know, whether they're being taught is up for debate, I guess, uh, and what the uh, interviews seem to require. Uh, definitely some clarity would be of great benefit, I think. I think speaking to that as well, I, I have a kind of a wide variety of students, and it, they come from completely different backgrounds. So I'll be teaching somebody in psychology, and I'll be teaching somebody who's doing an IT course, and I'll be teaching someone who's not doing any of those things. And I think a lot of them put different emphasis on games user research and what mm -hmm. it is, and it's difficult because you have to pitch it to them in a completely different way. You have to use different terminology. And, and as, as some of them really, they're at a loss. Some of them are like, why are we learning this? Why do we have to talk to users? Whereas other people are really, really excited about it. And you get a mixture of those in all of these courses because they're not specifically there to learn games user research. There also does seem to be a data science, data analytics overlap as well to some degree. I mean, even that's a term that really defies explanation. You know, when you say data scientist, it's little statistician, a little bit magician, right? In a lot of ways, there's a million different things that that person does. So there seems to be some overlap in that area as well. I think that also brings up a great point, which is sort of related to our next uh, question, which is um, there's some stuff that, that uh, we probably pretty clearly need to learn in an educational environment um, in terms of what we, depending on what particular job description we have. But there's also probably some things that make a lot of sense to learn on the job. And one of the things that I think would be sort of an interesting question for us to talk about is, is uh, what skill sets that are, that are critical to user researchers 
really ought to be learned before we leave school, uh, and then which, by contrast, could be learned, maybe even should be learned on the job at the location that we eventually wind up at. Um, I, I, for one, actually don't have a real clear sense on this. I think probably that some of the stuff like methods and, and uh, you know, methodologies, stats, design issues, some of that stuff, probably experimental design issues, probably belong in that first category. And uh, some of the more technique-oriented, you know, use, you know, verbal protocols or other types of techniques may fall more into the second, but I'm certainly prepared to be wrong about that. Um, I suspect that a lot of people will disagree vehemently. In fact, maybe some people on this panel. Um, so uh, I'd like to hear what other people have to say, I think, about that more than I do. I think I'm pretty biased on it because all of my background and all of my students' background is usually very, very hands-on, very, very much learning as you're doing. So even when I was doing my PhD, I was... Um, doing uh, usability studies as I went along and learning on the job and doing kind of consultancy work. And a lot of my students do similar things. We really kind of throw them in at the deep end and get them doing work with industry as soon as we can. Um, obviously, depending on the course, some courses have more scope for that than others. But um, I think it's really, really important to have a good grounding in theory and stuff before you do that as well, you know, to, to make sure that they don't go in completely blank because, you know, it, it is easy to make kind of big missteps and stuff if, if, if you are kind of, you know, in, in a really, really... Uh, complicated situation if you're given an issue that you've never had to deal with before. But it, it, I mean, it's good to teach people to think on their feet a little bit as well. I mean, I suppose since my background before, currently I'm working at Logitech, so I'm working on hardware, I'm working on gaming, mice, keyboards and everything. And so none of the stuff that I did in my education prepared me for working on hardware. We never did work necessarily on ergonomics. Uh, we were working very much on software and websites and apps. So, you know, it, it's really much, you're, you're given a different problem every day. You know, you have really have to think on your feet and kind of improvise and figure out how you're going to make a prototype of something before you can throw it out to the users and get people actually using it. And, um, yeah, I think it, you definitely need a mixture of theory and, and hands-on, but I don't know, in, in, in my opinion, I think hands-on is very, very important. You know, that in a little bit, and it's a very difficult target to hit. It's kind of a moving target, right? And we move so quickly that the time it takes me to get an undergraduate out, the industry is different. Um, so we're in a very odd place in trying to train a researcher. I mean, obviously, there are core competencies, uh, just basic data analysis, basic survey and research design, uh, basic experimental design, basic scientific method, things we all do in one way or another. Um, that you could certainly prepare someone for. But there's a fine balance, you know, of course, because as I say, you could spend 12 years on research methods in school and have an advanced doctorate, postdoctorate in nothing but research methods. Um, so it's tough. I think right now we're very much hitting a moving target. I just give them a smattering of information and hope some of it sticks much of the time. And I, that puts you in a very reactionary place as an educator. You're very quickly trying to change curriculum. And when you're in a, an institution the size of well, Penn State is enormous, 100,000 plus, you can't change that quickly, uh, just simply not agile enough to prepare the students in that sense. So it is a bizarre, a set of core competencies would be really beneficial. Um, I think uh, having a core base of knowledge to be able to, to base all your research around it is really important, but I feel like um, all the hands-on experience that, that we get in the lab is really, really beneficial because um, applying those skills and, and learning how to apply them to certain situations is really helpful. Um, we mostly work on games, but through the skills that I've learned there, I'm, I'm able to apply those different methodologies to other things as well, different types of software and different websites. Um, but without that core base of knowledge that we learn in our lectures, it would be much more difficult, I think, to be able to apply those same skills to other, other um, softwares and websites as well. So um, <clears throat> one of the, uh, the topics that, that uh, I think is sort of a hot button for, for us, at least in our particular program at Full Sail, uh, something we think about a lot, is whether it really makes sense to train people specifically to be game user researchers or whether it makes sense to train them to be user researchers in a broader sense. Um, whether games are really uniquely different in some way uh, from the, the sort of the, the broader human, broader field of sort of human assessment and interaction assessment. Um, I, I actually, again, don't have a really good, crisp uh, answer on this. I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, as, one of our, as one of our students likes to say, it, it depends. He's this Italian kid. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I feel like that there is some stuff, there's some basic human perception stuff that's really, really critical. Uh, you have to know some basic human factors, some concepts, some, some psychology, some, even some neurophysiology that, that's really relevant, and some perception, visual and auditory perception stuff. Um, but, and that's going to be universal across all those areas. But there's also some issues that come up, I think, with having a real good library 
of games and game knowledge in your head so that when you see a situation, you're not just responding to it as a user researcher that knows that you know, there's issues related to Fitz Law or to cognitive load or, uh, or mm -hmm. attentional blindness, but that you also are able to say, hey, look, this is really like that situation that happens in role-playing games where uh, people sort of uh, get, get in a situation where they're constrained by the choices they're given, and that doesn't match their internal representation of their character, and now they're upset. Um, and that's something that I think you kind of have to know the game space in order to be able to, to make those kinds of determinations. So uh, from my standpoint, I, I think you can probably do it either way, but I feel like to be really good at this, you have to have at least a significant piece that is game specific. Um, but I, I'd like to know what other panelists have to say about this, because I'm going to be very different. Well, it's, it's kind of difficult for me because we learn uh, really all of our education is, is kind of focused on games, but um, me personally, I would, I would love to know a little bit more of the technicalities behind all of the studies that we do. Um, I feel like it, it would probably give me a little bit of a better, uh, better skill set to writing the reports and uh, be able to give our partners a little bit better information overall. Yeah, I'm of the completely um, unscientifically validated opinion that uh, well, I suppose you could call this Thorndike's theory of identical elements. We try to make little, tiny indie game studios for our students inside of our very large building. Um, so we put them in very small development roles, and we match up individuals. And this is fairly typical of game development programs, so you know this. We match them up with programmers, artists, et cetera. And so when we do teach uh, usability, user research, and playtesting generally, um, I do operationalize that in a way where they're in a game context. And I think that's useful because uh, if you do intend to work as a games user researcher, some fundamental understanding of sort of production cycles, uh, you know, agile and scrum, development deadlines, timelines is, I think, mandatory. Uh, you'd be useless indeed if you could make very, very good observations the day before a product ships, right? I guess it, it's difficult for me because, for again, like I said earlier, a, a lot of our courses are you know, psychology-based or, uh, you know, IT-based. There's very few that are very, very much game design-based that I've worked with. And um, it, it, it's difficult because in terms of the industry in Ireland, it's a much smaller industry. There's not as many positions for people uh, in the games industry without having to move out of the country. So part of me feels like we have a bit of a responsibility to try and prepare people for the positions that will be available for them, you know, as educators to not to not like ship out like a hundred people who are ready to work in games user research and there's not there's nothing there, there's no infrastructure for them to work in. So I, I definitely think that there does need to be more of a games focus, but I I guess from my experience a lot of my work has been very kind of user research focused and a little bit of games rather than the other way around. I can echo that. That's the way we actually teach our entire game development programs is a minor augmenting, usually an engineering degree or sometimes a psychology degree. Uh, and yeah, that's the same. We're in a very um, sort of economically depressed part of Pennsylvania. And when our goal, of course, as a state institution is not to ship out all of our graduates out of the state. Uh, so in that sense, the, the university's mandate is to keep it uh, as an augmenting minor so that in the event that a local job comes up, we don't cripple them by giving them only the games background. So I'd certainly can appreciate that, yeah. Cool. So uh, this actually sort of leads us, and uh, uh, this is a topic that I know Matt's gonna really like, um, to the, the, one of the big questions I think for me is, uh, is how important is stats and, and quantitative methods, that sort of, that sort of, because that's, that's a relatively- Mandatory. Yeah, <laughs> it's a relatively difficult and, and cognitively expensive skill set to learn. Like, yeah. It takes a lot of effort to get, get good at stats, get good at visualization and data science, broadly speaking. Um, I think it's an interesting question because you know, one, one thing I often find is that, is that not only do we often not use those methods as much as maybe we think we would, as at least I would as an experimental psychologist, um, but also I find that a lot of times the partners we work with don't like or understand them uh, in some cases and, and don't really want some of that methodology. On the other hand, there are moments when really nothing else will do. Uh, you really have to have a sort of analytics stats um, uh, approach to something. Uh, I sort of feel like it actually, this may, be, may I go back to our original question about job descriptions where uh, maybe what we really need is sort of two separate, uh, two separate jobs here, someone who's like sort of quantitatively driven, uh, you know, uh, statistically uh, um, sophisticated type of, of data scientist, and then someone who's a more qualitatively focused and, uh, and sort of psych type, uh, type approach to this. So, but there may be lots of other ways of looking at this. Matt's probably bursting to speak here. 
It's okay. <laughs> this is a topic on which I could go on a very long alcohol-fueled rant. No, I <laughs> not at not at ten in the morning. That's for the after party. Yes, there you go. No, um, yes, to keep your complaints till after. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, it's uh, it's it's a it's a relevant question. I mean, it, you're certainly right to some degree that not everybody needs to be able to do these sort of complex power analyses and things because, and I mean, we were speaking about this on the way over here. Um, it's an it's an interesting thing. Uh, executives, uh, stakeholders often don't even want to see or know what these numbers are. You know, when you talk about these very granular statistical concepts and uh, probability density functions and whatnot, they don't, they don't care. They really don't care. So some degree of data visualization, I think, is very important. And somewhere on the team, I do believe, there needs to be somebody who is doing the math, so to speak, behind the scenes. But oftentimes, delivering the data to the people who really need that data you know, it requires very little other than Tableau or Excel, which is very basic. Um, I, I still will defend that one person on the team, though, should be doing the math. Uh, somebody's got to be flying this thing. Adult supervision, is that what we're getting at? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think it's still really, really important for somebody to be able to do that stuff. I mean, when I was doing any of my academic research uh, before I started working in the industry, I mean, really, it was it was a mixture of quantitative and qualitative. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, you have to have the quantitative. I think it's really, really important for somebody to have the skill set. And I will keep um, saying that to promote my own job security. <laughs> Please hire at least one statistician. <laughs> Well, like, uh, so I was talking to a friend of mine at, at another big company recently, and he was saying that there was a team and they were doing loads of research and were collecting loads of data, and he was on a completely separate team, and he shouldn't have been working with them at all, but they had to pull him in to do the statistics for them. And it was really good that they had the resource to pull him in, mm -hmm. but if they hadn't, they would have just been left with a big ream of data, and they wouldn't have been able to do anything with it. They wouldn't have known what, what conclusions to draw at all. One of the m most interesting functions of statistics, and I mean, I, I'll say this as a quantitative person, you know, I think it's the keys to the universe, and, 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 but uh, you will notice patterns that you might otherwise have missed. So um, while it's not important to take a probability density function and give it to a shareholder, what is that? They have no use for it. It is important to spend some time, you know, with coffee and a whiteboard looking at it yourself to say, hey, here's a pattern we didn't necessarily notice that's evident in this data that might otherwise be missed. I think it's like qualitative tools. I think it's a way to gather insight that is not readily available on the surface. But then it's also good to have the qualitative so you can go back and look at the pattern and talk to people and go, oh, maybe that pattern didn't actually mean anything. It just you know, happened to, to come up that it's way. And triangulation. You know, there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a gambler's fallacy in one-on-one -on -one, uh, research, I find, because if you see, for example, uh, you know, a, a usability error that happens three, four times in a testing session, you might be inclined to think that that is a very common error, and then that might very simply not bear out in data, or vice versa, it might not show up at all, and then again in the data, be everywhere. So I, I think that triangulation is necessary and useful. I think it's really important to be able to have both those skill sets. Um, we actually recently kind of ran into an issue when one of our partners came back and told us that we had too much information in a report that we delivered to them, so we had yes. to go back and um, you know, better visually represent the data that we came up with um, in a more understandable way to their, their team so they could implement that information better. Um, so I think it's really important to be able to do the analytics and be able to um, you know, manipulate the numbers in the Excel spreadsheet, but I think it's also really important to be able to make it look pretty and present it to uh, your clients and partners in a, in a very comprehensible way. You know, the more I think about this, though, maybe it's important to have two statisticians, because if you have one and only one person that understands the math, that is very dangerous. Yes, it is. You are trusting that person absolutely yep. with the data. I mean, the statistician, a translator. You know, translator, yeah, there you go. So uh, one of the, the topic areas that, that also I think is, uh, makes sense to cover here is this notion of of growing our educational establishment. We have a relatively limited uh, mm -hmm. bandwidth in our pipeline at this point. There aren't a lot of programs that are training people specifically for the game industry and in in user research fields. Um, certainly we can draw people from lots of other domains, but uh, I think there's some, some interesting question here on whether we need, uh, or if we do need, how to promote more programs that are specifically training people for, for this type of profession. Um, my own thoughts on this, I don't, I don't feel like we have a shortage of candidates out there, one thing I think we really are lacking, though, is is a a system for sort of helping people who are already in the industry um, to both stay current with 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 uh, emerging methods from elsewhere, uh, but also to to provide some of those some sort of uh, continuing continuing education support service uh, type um, type resources to people who 
maybe got into user research from a path that was different from everybody else and doesn't have the same background necessarily, doesn't necessarily have all the skill sets we've talked about here. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I think it's very difficult for people to get access to that if, if, they, if they want it. Um, and I'd like to see that uh, improve. I know that uh, Maggie, I don't know if Maggie's in here, over at Northeastern was just looking at something related to this. I saw her, her uh, panel at GUR, GEC this year. Um, but I, I think that's something we as an industry need to think a little bit about here too. Um, I, I, I also think that one of the problems potentially with growing our educational footprint is that uh, although the industry that we're going, or putting students into is definitely growing, I don't know if it's growing fast enough to support more than eight to 12 people a year uh, that are coming out of a, a particular program. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we want to do is flood the market with people who are not, um, we're not going to be able to get jobs because then that's essentially we're losing that talent to elsewhere. They'll go into simulation and training or some other area where they, and, and then we'll never get them back. So I, I feel like there's sort of a, there needs to be a little more focus on building that whole pipeline out so that we're bringing in the right kind of people, the right number of people, bringing them to the right roles, uh, and then supporting them throughout their career. Sorry, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> My bad. Well, uh, I can kind of I kind of spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I feel like we can kind of reevaluate the demand for these different skill sets a little bit better once we have that consistency in the terminology, um, with you know d the differences between a, a UX design position and a researcher <coughs> position. Um, I personally, when I when I was looking for a job, I found tons of jobs. It was just really sifting through and finding the one that had our particular skill set that we learned, which was primarily research. Um, so that was the the most difficult thing for me in that regard. It's really funny because I'm sure probably lots of people in the room have had the same thing. But yeah, when you look mm -hmm. for job descriptions and you're reading through and it's like, oh, cool, user experience research, and you read through and it's like you need to be like proficient in Photoshop, like yeah, or exactly. you know you need to, you need exactly. to be able to, to code in C++. Yes, and exactly. I'm like, How did this get so in here? I can yep. do wireframes, but I mean like beyond that, I'm I, I, yeah. you know we're not designers, you know. Exactly. That was exactly the problem. You know, we built um, the game dev program in the last five, six years at Penn State. I mean, my master's was in instructional design, and that was sort of why they brought me there. Um, it, I think, really, we need a, um, a mid-career certificate or master's degree. I don't call me uh, tired of undergrads. Sorry, guys. But um, I don't think there's a strong need to generate, right now anyway, a huge amount of undergraduate games user research graduates. Uh, I feel like individuals with a strong research background mid-career could shift into this role more easily. And that's not me stepping on any of your toes. Please continue to learn about research. But the timeline isn't right. That's not me saying, I mean, at Penn State, if we were to make the program, it would take us a decade. So it means even to start it. That's so maybe it will be by that time. But I feel like a mid-career thing is probably more viable at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's time. For I us agree as well. with that as well. Like um, my I my undergraduate degree is in business economics, which is is very different. But from that background, it allowed me to learn a lot about analytics and being able to man manipulate numbers, you know, through finance classes and things like that. But we also have students from a lot of different backgrounds that I think it's interesting because they can bring that perspective to the, their research that they do and kind of give it a little bit of a twist depending on what the clients are looking for uh, to, for us to answer. I think it's really interesting to see all the different backgrounds. So I, I agree with Dr. White. I think it's something interesting that I, I found as well. Like, so a lot of my teaching has been in undergraduate, and it's been like very much like full-time courses. Mm -hmm. But I have done a bit of teaching online as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people are people who are in their job, and they want to pick up some new skills. Yes. And, and there are people who are out there who are just so eager to learn this and to bring that to their company, because their company doesn't have someone who's going to be a full maybe games user researcher, but you know they need those skills on their team. And mm -hmm. you know I think there is a hunger for it out there. So speaking of hunger for stuff out there, um, I'd like to hear from our fifth panelist out here. So what what uh, what do you guys think about it? What, what, what's what, what are your interests in this relate in this area? What can we answer or discuss that would be relevant to you? Yeah. So I, I come from a different direction. I'm a statistician. Um, I have friends who know where I am. And <laughs> game data, that we engage in a little bit of a false dichotomy of the quantitative versus the non-quantitative. And I want to tell you why I think it's a false dichotomy. I, I came to looking at game data because I was hired by a game company a number of years ago to found an analytics group for them. And what I found was that I couldn't hire people who had just common sense about data. 
So I spent a lot of time hiring uh, MBAs um, who knew about averages but not about medians or quantiles, <laughs> and explaining to them that human behavior isn't really described very well by averages, we're creatures of extremes. And so I wanted, based on that experience, I wanted to suggest that maybe if we think of highfalutin statistical mathematical methods over here, and what's desperately needed in the game industry as the wrong dichotomy. I think that what the game industry desperately needs is people who can describe uh, the central quartiles and add just the diversity of behavior. And I think there's a huge opportunity there for people with uh, user research experience, because I know that that level of quantitative statistical sophistication is, is, is really prevalent in this community. Um, because a lot of the things that my MBA and later PhD uh, uh, game analysts found was that the places where our games were failing as live services were simple cognitive barriers to play early on. That I would love to see user interface researchers, user researchers in that field of being the game analysts working with live games. Matt, you got thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, Maybe. you know, it's uh, it's funny. Even the average sort of failures of understanding of probability that an otherwise extremely well-educated person has. Um, you can speak to individuals who are brilliant, who have been working on games, who are staggeringly intelligent, who will sincerely believe that if a coin is flipped heads six times, the seventh time is certainly going to be tails. Um, I mean, just complete failures of logic. But. I mean, I, I think you're right. To some degree, we hear statistics and we think, you know, complicated integral mathematics that are the, the province of stodgy old university professors swilling whiskey. And maybe we're right. But I, some degree of basic statistical competency to the average person would be super useful in the games industry. To that end, please enroll in my online statistics course in the summer. I get a small stipend. <laughs> Other Only slightly topic. joking. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I see back here. Uh, I'm curious about um, one of the distinctions between university and more applied work being that in university, there's often we, um, we might study and research and write papers and not care whether anyone does anything with it. But you know, mm -hmm. in applied sense, you want people to make decisions. And so therefore, asking research questions that are paired with the appropriate decision is in some ways the, the hardest art. Um, even in some ways, if you define a good question as one that might influence a, a useful decision. Um, but how do you predict what's going to be the right decision? There's, that seems like a really difficult pairing. It's something that I feel like a lot of traditional science types in universities don't have to deal with. Um, so I'm curious about that kind of decision science side. You know, mm -hmm. Things like avoiding groupthink, things like how do you influence the right levels in the organization? Are you just working with a designer, or are you were trying to talk about product choices and, and new product planning, is that part of the um, kind of teaching that, that you all encountered or, or think that's something that our field should be moving forward? Noreen, that'd be good one for you. I, get, I, I guess I've, it's never something that we've studied in terms of decision analysis. I mean, what, if I was running a user study, I probably tend to do like a stakeholder needs analysis and requirements analysis to begin with. So that includes the users, but it would also include anybody at a higher level who has a stake in whatever the project is going to be. And then I guess I would use that later on to help make decisions. But I guess when you're working in industry, you, you don't necessarily get to make the decisions. I mean, if you're, if you're working in the research area, what, what I guess you'll usually do is you'll, you'll do a piece of research and you'll come to your conclusions, and you'll present them, and then it's up to them to make the decisions based on it. So you don't necessarily make the decisions yourself. Yeah, early on, when we first started doing the work that we do with UX Lab, bringing in sort of partners from outside, outside, outside commercial game projects. Um, we were very much a, let's tell them what's, you know, what we identified and then let them you know, be the experts and make the decisions. Um, and that actually was not very popular with the people that we worked with. Yeah. Uh, we got a lot of feedback that they wanted us to tell them what to do, um, yes. which, which was really scary, frankly, because we are not game designers. Um, and sometimes, and I think I was talking about this with, with Matt on the way over here, we get it. We do a lot of work, sort of pro bono work for very small indie studios, Kickstarters, people who can't afford UX testing um, at all. And, uh, and we'll get a game of theirs and we'll test it and we'll identify like 16 things, 16 issues of varying severity. 
and we'll send it to them. Um, we'll make a few recommendations, and then like we'll get a build back a week later, and they've done they've slavishly implemented every single thing that we said, um, which is really kind of terrifying because you know on the one hand great they listened, on the other hand, you know, it, and Matt had a great analogy. This like so if you walk into your into your boss's office and say I want a twenty percent raise, and they say done, like clearly that didn't go the way it's like something's wrong, right? Like you should have asked for forty percent yeah. or yeah something something didn't really go right, um, and that that can happen too. So like we we now do. Uh, we do identify what we think were the issues we observed, and we'll make recommendations with real sort of careful, like, consider the following, and then mm -hmm. some recommendations, like real sort of hands off, yeah, fingers back, very polite sort of stuff. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's tricky because a lot of people do want that feedback. On the other hand, I don't know that we're the best people to give it uh, in terms of, like, how should you do this? And even if we were... Um, to some degree, it's, it, we have sort of an un, unfair advantage over them. I mean, the, the consultant is always right, right? I mean, that's like, not that they are, but that's sort of the perception a lot of times. You know, interestingly, I think this feeds into what this gentleman was saying before as well. I think there's a perception, uh, very much like when you visit a physician, that the uh, disconnect between the thing that you personally possess, a body, mm -hmm. and actual knowledge about that body and how to fix it is so arcane and so difficult and so incredibly uh, you know, taxing that you should just take that person's advice 100% at face value. So it, 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 for me anyway, it goes back to the statistics research science uh, piece where um, an, an otherwise brilliant individual believes that whatever we're doing is so unbelievably arcane right. that they should just take our like sage advice. And I, that is a dangerous place to be. And I think, uh, I think education of, of, of any kind, pro bono, Khan Academy, is a good way to uh, sort of defeat that because it's very dangerous to give any one person that amount of. You know, the benevolent dictator is not always benevolent. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's part of a process as well, though, because I mean, so if someone walks into you and they give you, you know, their game and you 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 do some testing and you come back to them and you give them a list of 16 things that they need to change. If they implement all of those 16 things, you're still gonna to need to do more testing to check if those things don't clash with each other or if there's any extra mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, implementing those 16 things could sometimes cause further issues. There's education facing in the other direction as well because there's still, despite this growing year after year after year, there's still a huge contingent of people making games. And when I say, oh, I do user research and data analytics, and they say, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, it, they have absolutely no idea what we do. So in the other direction, I think it's important to understand, manage the expectations of individuals that are hiring user researchers, that are employing user researchers, that we're in fact not going to give you concrete 100% design recommendations because we're, we're not sages for hire, rather we just are very good at pointing out human level problems. And that, that I think is an education going the other way that needs to happen as well, C consistent communication. Humility is helpful no matter what you do, I think, and making sure that everybody understands that. Yeah? Uh, it kind of speaks to me, uh, well, I'm a game designer and a design led researcher, so it's very interesting to be listening to both sides <laughs> in a way, because sure. I kind of find myself in the middle. Um, it, it kind of seems like a research report or summary is not a design brief. Right. But those are completely different. So my question is, how have you um, so far navigated that space of having to create something that, you know, talks to the research you made, but at the same time starts speaking in their language too, so that they can see it more as a design challenge and not so much as, well, this is, are the results of what we did. You should take it and just like digest well, it and it's yours. A lot of times, uh, you know, we're really encouraged to say objective. That's really the main goal for our reports, but we can also make suggestions um, on how to maybe implement certain things that that'll make it more easily usable for for their uh, for their users or their players. Um, but it, it is really hard to navigate that um, suggestion objective line without telling them what you th might think would be best implemented for their game uh, that you think would 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 really help their users. It's difficult, but it's definitely doable. I think I got into this uh, out of a passion for having small, trivial facts that I can kind of dispense. Um, I am that guy at the party, and you know, did you know we're going to be on Cirrus in a few days? And then, so um, <laughs> the reason I say that is uh, when I present anything to anybody, even in contracting work, it's literally just facts. Like it's, it's facts, things that can't be disputed, numbers, and they're not 
predictions. They're just things that are currently real and happening. Um, and there are there is no advice in there. It's just this is what's happening. Do with that what you'd like to do with that. So for example, one that's really interesting is uh, someone over here mentioned um, sort of stodgy old academics, and that reminded me. Uh, I was reading a, just a tweet, and I'm not 100% sure, no data source, whatever, that there's a strong correlation between the number of semicolons that appear in an academic paper and its citation index. So is it positive or that, negative? Positive. So that <laughs> by itself is a statement that indicates more semicolons, my stage, more citations. The statement by itself doesn't indicate you should put more semicolons into your papers. However, that's often the result. So I try to keep all of my research reports and any kind of research discussion in the province of the statement, not the recommendation. Yeah, for being, that reason. Yeah, I mean, I mean, being being descriptive instead of proscriptive, I think, is also important. Like, hey, this is what we saw. This is what it might mean. But you know, I, we try when we can to stop short of saying, "Go do this." Um, but there are points where you know, often I actually find there's a another correlation between the severity of the issue we've observed and how much we feel like we have to make recommendations. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we'll see something, we're like, oh my god, that's terrible. Everybody, 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 everybody missed that. I have um, a lot of disclaimers on everything I say. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's, I think that's more just protecting myself, honestly. But it is a, it is a habit to give disclaimers. And I say, well, Bayesian analysis changes all the time, so you know, take this with a grain of salt. And, but uh, I don't think that's necessary. I'm just, maybe I'm sheepish. Sometimes if you're talking to people who aren't familiar with research too and you're presenting something to them, I mean stuff that's so basic for us where it's like correlation does not imply causation, right? right? Mm -hmm. yes. They, they, yes. they, they just right. don't necessarily, they don't necessarily do that. If they see a correlation and if you explain that there is a correlation, they will just take from that, you know, that there is causation there. And it's important to kind of let them know exactly where we're coming from with it, I think. Yes. Yeah. So, a bit of a tangent. Um, our company has been approached recently by a college program, by an administrator of a college program, mm -hmm. where they teach uh, game design, they have a game design program. And they had the idea of adding a single playtest, now called user research course, to that program. And they wanted kind of our feedback on whether it's a good idea and, and what would you teach. And my question is to you guys is that a good idea for a game design program? What would you teach if you had one course? Ooh. <laughs> That's a really scary one because it's kind of the like no enough to cause harm and not enough to do good problem. I mean, you could certainly, yeah. I, my wife jokes that I know enough, she's Filipino, I know enough Tagalog to get myself into trouble and not enough to get back out again. Um, <laughs> and I can sort of see that situation happening where you know enough to, to, to be able to set up a study and, and run it and get data and have it be totally worthless and not know that. Um, so I think if I had the time, I would teach maybe one or two very basic procedural methods like probably a think aloud and a play test and um, and then show them some real like plug and play standard designs for a play test uh, and then to some degree you just kind of have to hope for the best on that I, I but I, I do I'm actually kind of ambivalent about that I, I almost would rather not do it um, than do one class and hope that it works because that's sort of the very definition of the sophomore right like the, yep. you know just enough not to know what you don't know I think I I think I respectfully uh, disagree and the reason I say that is uh, I'm, I'm with you that it certainly could cause some damage, but I think we have like an adolescence right now that we're sort of going through um, industrially in user research. And I think part of uh, getting through that is the awkward pimple covered stage where we do have people with mixed levels of mm -hmm. uh, understanding. When we teach, um, when we teach, when it's we the teach image, game, right? yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, make sure it's just very vivid. Um, <laughs> It's early. Uh, when we teach game design, I mean, we teach a little bit of programming, and you might ask why. And, uh, you know, these kids will come out with very limited programming knowledge. I mean, they're certainly not going to write multi threading algorithms or anything, but they have some basic event driven programming understanding. And the reason for that is, you know, the idea is you don't want a game designer who says, we need 50 million particles on the screen right now, and has no idea why that's a problem, right? Um, at the same time, my hope, and I'm very hopeful on this end, that a single user research course might give you the idea that when someone says, you know, there's a serious usability problem here, that they at least understand the, the verbiage of what's being said to them. So if you have an individual who's working as a game designer and they have a full-time user research person on staff, I think this course could at the very least um, help them understand the things that are coming out of the mouths of the researchers. Because like, the communication is a huge problem between people that do this kind of work and people that are actually building the games. And that is a massive monumental problem. So what would you teach game designers to help them work with games and researchers? I think I'd love to make them research something completely trivial. 
try to find a way to quantitatively and qualitatively evaluate the experience of purchasing and consuming a six pack of beer and write a research report with 10 participants. Something that gives them an idea of the process, some of the methods that are used, and some of the language that's used around that topic. I think that, that the language and the understanding is really critical. Um, because certainly with one course, you're not gonna make a, one university course does not an educated individual make. So um, I think that at the introductory level, getting them to do something with very low impact will give them at least a, a vocabulary to sort of be talking in this area. Also, just to be aware of the fact that user research is a thing, even if it was the right. most basic thing, because th like you say, there's a lot of people who you'll say, you know, you do data analytics and you do user research, and they have no idea what you're talking about. Right. And even if they just had like a, a one semester, like really, really short module just to explain what that was, uh, maybe they'd be in a company later and they'd say, actually, maybe we need to do some user research on this thing and get a user researcher in here to do it, you know? And you know, I, I agree with you that it can be dangerous to give someone like yeah. a little bit of knowledge and that, you know, that they might think that they understand everything and be able to do like huge studies, but. It's all undergrads, you know. isn't it? Hmm? So it's all undergrads, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Sorry, guys. But yeah, so I, I, think, I think it's probably positive to give them some awareness that this is a thing that exists. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of a balancing act at the moment. If I didn't have the, you know, the hands-on experience, I mean, we have about, you know, average about six months of hands-on experience on how to run these play tests. I mean, the the data that we would get from them would just be completely invalid because of the, because of you know all the all the little errors that you can make when setting up a play test. Um, you know, the test plans, things like that. There's a lot that can go wrong that can mess up your data. And without that experience, that kind of like trial and error process, um, it's really difficult to, um, you know, be able to teach that to somebody in in a course. I think without having that hands-on. Valid you know, experience. Realistically, over the degrees I've taken, every single one had a research methods course. Like, so I mean, I've functionally taken that same course five times. Um, I think they really do try to hammer that in because uh, it's it's simple, silly things that can completely screw up everything you're doing. You know, anchoring bias. You know, you say you just am open with a question that leads them in a certain direction, and then everything you get is garbage. Right. Uh, so it, yeah, it is tough. It is a it is a tough question to answer, but I think a good one. Anybody else? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you say that then you, have, you would have to give usability and user research degrees the same treatment that you're giving game design? Since, like, you teach game designers about art and programming, uh, wouldn't you do the same for user, uh, people who learn user research? You would want to teach them about design, programming, and art, just so, they could, so that they can communicate effectively with the, those other people and actually uh, they're able to make suggestions, uh, accurate suggestions on how to fix usability uh, problems that they find on studies like uh, usability uh, reports and stuff like that. I think that's really interesting because it's one of those things where if you just even know a little bit about programming, programming and if you know a little bit about design, you, you can kind of understand maybe the scope of what is possible in that area even and be, not be asking someone for something that is completely impossible for them to achieve for, to create some particular type of experience that you think that sh we should be able to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, and it gives you the language that you wouldn't necessarily have to be able to have those really, really important initial conversations about that. On a project. I think, yeah, I think there's a risk of a, you know, in game design, or game development, excuse me, studios, you're always trying to promote community. I mean, that's part of our theme. That's part of what you're always trying to do. Uh, you want everybody to be very cohesive and work together well, and that's true of any business. I, I think every time I've ever done work like this, I feel like they think we're like medical testers, like they need to stay six feet back <laughs> because they don't, you know, when we talk about, again, anchoring bias, when we talk about that, you know, we always politely ask people not to speak with people when they're play testing. I mean, at least I, I do, I'm sure we all do. Um, I don't think they know why we're doing that. So I think they think we're just rude. So, I mean, at the very least, you could promote cohesion by allowing people to understand that there, you know, there are methods here. We're not just trying to be jerks when we say, hey, damn it, don't tell them anything about the game before I ask questions. We're not trying to be bad people, but they don't understand why we're doing that, I think. So there's a communication element that I think could be greatly enhanced by some minimum level of competency. Yeah, I think I may have come down on the wrong side of that before now that we're, I think the panel has talked me into a slight, slight change of heart on this. I, I do think they're, they're probably, given the points that I'm making, I think that that's a good point. Just knowing at least something um, does, does do a lot to, uh, to make it easier to communicate across across different disciplines. How are we on time? Eight minutes. Okay, Perfect. So we still got a little bit left. Yeah. I have a 
about um, video documentation. Do you find yourselves doing more of this kind of the screen capture? Partly because you can spend a lot of time, it was mentioned communication, like, and interfacing with um, designers. In some ways, a report is so nice, it has that neutral science feel, we can use passive voice, you know, we can, but, but on the other hand, the video may be much more compelling, especially for that vague gray area where it's not just about a bunch of players fell off something here, but a bunch are a little, seem a little confused here, or, or, or maybe are feeling the emotion that you wanted them to feel here. Um, is there like mixing the interview video with video from something like how people are moving around on a screen? Is that something you're teaching students or want to move in that direction? I'm just kind of curious about the range. So we actually recently uh, did a usability test for a game that is still under NDA, so I can't speak about the title or anything, but we did video capture for it. Um, so we did uh, screen capture as well as uh, we can see the participant's face throughout. And we also have audio from uh, what the participant was saying. So if there's any particular question that our partners or clients want to address, we can always go back to a certain part in that video and review that and, and present the results from, you know, and answer the question, whatever it may be that they, they need to know. But would you show them parts of the video as part of your presentation? Sure, if, if they want that, we can definitely do that. Um, we, I mean, I mean, we can even, you know, with technology, can stream live video to them if they want to see it, you know, live action, the, the people playing it, if they they want to. That's always kind of dangerous. Uh, you don't want them to, you know, say, oh, I, I know exactly what's wrong and, like, run off and, and, you know, fix whatever they think is wrong. You want them to see each individual participant and, and what happens across the board. But, um, yeah, it's definitely very helpful. I think it's, it's a good tool for a, a larger toolbox. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense. Sometimes it doesn't. We did a test about a year back where we were testing with children, and we found pretty quickly we couldn't necessarily trust what they were telling us. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually went back and did a lot of that work with um, eye tracking and and video clips um, because they could lie. I mean, they could they would tell us things that you know kids have a real elastic view of 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 reality, um, and they would tell us stuff that was you know clearly demonstrably wrong. Um, but if we watched what they did and what they were looking at and how they were reacting rather than what they were saying. In some cases, that was really helpful. Um, there's also moments when you get like, where, where, where it actually can be a, a, a it's, this is gonna sound kind of cruel, but there are moments when it also allows you to overcome sort of institutional resistance on the part of your partners. I worked on a project once many years ago, we were assessing a refrigerator that had this new ice maker built into it, and something like a third of our participants dumped ice down their shirts trying to use this thing. And we came back and gave this report, and the engineering team clearly thought we were idiots. Like, who did you have testing this? Um, and so we said, you know what, tell you what, we'll come back in a week, we'll, we'll check our findings again, we'll come back in a week. So we came back a week later with a little montage of the video of these guys doing this, and we set it to music, so it's dun, 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 <laughs> yeah. And you can sort of watch the guy, it was kind of cool, you sort of watch him sort of slumping down in his seat as the, the thing went on. But there are times when you have to overcome that kind of resistance. You have a really good point to make and nobody believes you. And just having the video makes a huge difference sometimes, and they can just see it go, oh, yeah, that. So. I'm gonna take the overly signed Typical approach here. Um, one thing I like to do, I, like I teach students generally about sort of double blind methodologies. Like I don't know what the feature is. I don't know what the designer wants out of this feature. I'm going to evaluate it completely in a fishbowl. Then I'm going to give it to someone else. Um, that's sometimes not realistic. Uh, let me rephrase. That is almost never realistic. Um, but one thing I'm, and the reason I bring this up, one thing I'm anxious about when we talk about delivering reports to people, I like to have another individual look over things because there's a fear, so for example, I was working on, uh, again, undisclosed game, um, and there's a feature that I personally really liked, I mean me, in my own life, in other games, um, that was being evaluated for the chopping block for this particular project. And so that clearly biases me toward wanting to find evidence that this is going to be useful uh, in this particular project. Um, I try, again, to be as wry and scientific and raw as possible with the data, but then there's a weird balance because, well, Adams is correct that displaying data in such a manner that it is palatable and entertaining and drives a point home is certainly more likely to communicate it. I feel very uneasy about me being the person that decides what gets driven home in an advertising sense. Do you understand what I mean? So the video portion to me is super helpful to communicate, but then I wonder, should I be communicating it like this? You know, am I tacitly manipulating here? So that, that is, again, just the over-scientific thing from me. But anyway. I have left Anyone? the room agape. Anyone? There we go. Uh, actually, Daniel, I think your hand went up first. Did you? I already asked mine. 
Oh, okay. okay. Um, do you think having a prototyping uh, testing experience is more necessary for students to be able to work uh, as a researcher, like having uh, already run a playtest or something like that on a game or like you follow? Sorry, so the question is... Do you think it's moratory or, or something we should aim to teach the students or having an experience Sure, like a familiarity with playtesting generally is going to be extremely helpful because when these are being run in studios, I mean, having your average game designer, programmer, producer, artist, uh, being familiar with that process from beginning to end, I think, uh, you know, pursuant to Daniel's earlier question, I think would really create a conversation, which is very important. I think, I think we're about like done. We're, yeah, let's look we're about out of time. Are we? Yep. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much All for right, your thank attention. You so we much. appreciate it. Yeah, thanks very much, guys.